right? Uh, I would like to welcome all of you here tonight. And um, I'm very happy and it's a great pleasure to um, welcome and present Mario Carpo, who is coming for a second time to the AA to work uh, with the uh, MA students in uh, history critical thinking for the whole week uh, and of course present part of, uh, part of his uh, ongoing uh, research to uh, the AA community. Uh, Mario um, started his seminars yesterday with the MA students and we had a second um, discussion this morning and we have the final one tomorrow morning and everybody who uh, would wish to come to join us, please do. Uh, tomorrow morning we are meeting at 11 o'clock in 33 um, first floor back. And uh, during the seminars, Mario um, at, is kind of outlining, if I could use the term of, of, of course, uh, Mario can correct me, to outline an archaeology of the digital starting from the now or perhaps starting from the what the future might be and going all the way back to Alberti and Vitruvius. And I think to this evening, Mario is going to present a new part of his uh, research uh, and put forward, I think, a quite provocative <coughs> argument uh, uh, quite novel in uh, the area of digital theory. Uh, Mario Carpo uh, is one of the few people who uh, has been working uh, and focusing on the relationship between uh, the architectural theory, history of culture, history of media, and history of technology. In one way, he's looking at developments in technology and new technologies of design in order to uh, understand and, um, and analyze the way in which they affect uh, how we conceive uh, design, how we make, how we uh, produce, and also the ways in which we perceive, we evaluate, we assess, and somehow relate to the final product, <coughs> to the artifact. Um, I think by doing that, uh, uh, Mario is opening up uh, an, a set of very critical and novel issues relating, uh, regarding both our practice, the role of our practice, um, and also the status of the artifact today. And I think that's, a, a, for me at least, that constitutes a very uh, big contribution to what we may call, uh, we may describe in terms of digital theory. Mario is an architectural historian. He um, um, was educated in Italy. And after his uh, um, training as a historian and after his PhD, he taught in a number of uh, European universities He's been uh, in, uh, um, a professor of architectural history in Paris at the uh, Ecole Paris La Villette. At the same time, he's been a visiting professor of architectural history at Yale University. And he was a professor of architectural history at the Georgia Institute of Technology for three years. Three years, or yeah, more or less. <laughs> um, so he's, in one way, spending his time between, uh, right now, between Europe, Paris, and the US. And of course, he's uh, teaching, writing, and uh, publishing a number of uh, books and articles. His most well-known uh, recent publications are The Alphabet and the Algorithm, which was published in 2011 and also Architecture in the Age of Printing, which was published in 2001. Also, he co-edited a number of uh, essays uh, on uh, the technologies of architectural representation. And what that, the title on, of that collection was uh, Perspective, Projections, 
and uh, design. And of course, he's the author of several articles and essays which have been published in a number of journals, both European and American journals. Uh, but I would like to stop here and invite Mario to present another part of his work. And we do hope that we'll have uh, Mario next year <laughs> to present perhaps the, uh, another chapter of his ongoing work. <laughs> Mario, please come. Thank you, Marina. Thank you for the generous introduction. Now, I have to do a change of glasses to read my paper, which means that from now on, I do not see you. Do you still see me? Good. Can you also? hear me can you hear me good and at some point we can even use this probably good thanks for having me here once again i was here last fall in the fall of 2011 and when i last came i had just published that little book which Marina just mentioned, where I recount the history of a digital turn in architecture from the early 90s, when in my opinion it started, to, to when I finished writing the book, which was in 2010. To make a long story short, meaning 250 pages, but small pages in uh, two lines, in that book I divided the history of digitally intelligent design into um, three stages or phases. First, the age of form, of digital form making. Second, the age of standards, or rather of the unmaking of standards, the age of digital non-standards. And a third period, which in my opinion started early in the years 2000, where the emphasis was on agency or on the unmaking of the traditional humanistic and modern notion of authorship in design. This is where, in my opinion, we still are, historically speaking, because this is still, in my opinion, an unfolding story. Digital authorship in general, and authorship in digital design in particular, meaning who makes what in a digital environment, is still very much an open experimental field where plenty of exciting new things keep happening. When I spoke here last fall, my topic was the challenge of digital participation and open-ended interactivity in the arts of design, what I call the digital style of many hands. Today my topic is the second chapter, the follow-up to that story, namely, the more general challenge of indeterminacy in design, and some of its theoretical and technical implications. What happens when designers decide to leave some design decisions to random chance, today interpreted and mediated and enacted by digital tools, and why should they do so anyway? Design is supposed to be an alternative to chance, not a complement. To it. And the problem, of course, is that we do not what chance is, regardless of the tools we may use to represent it. And opinions on that matter, on what chance means, diverge very much. But before we tackle this insurmountable philosophical issue, let me go back briefly to an easier topic, to the recent history of design theory, to see how and why indeterminacy came to play such a central role in today's digitally intelligent design. The story of the digital turn in architecture in the 90s is well known, and it has been told many times. We all know the protagonist. Most of them uh, talked or teach in this school. It is the story of how the constructivism collided with early computer-aided design, 
spline modelers and animation software. Merged with the Deleuzian fold, evolved towards globular shapes and topological geometry, while riding on the wave of the technological optimism of the 90s, and then crashing with it around the turn of the century. So far, so good, we know this story. With hindsight, however, and almost 20 years later, we can now perceive from a more distant vantage point the fragments of another story, which is today often forgotten, but which was vividly recorded in the literature of the time. Strange as it may appear today, in the early 90s, the digital turn was seen by many of its protagonists. And I think of Greg Lynn, Stan Allen, Alejandro de Rapolo, and many others. It was seen as a continuation, a reenactment, a vindication almost of some, not of all, but of some ideas that architectural postmodernists had been advocating since at least the late 70s. Moreover, we can now also tell that while the digital turn in architecture derived and descended in part from some ideas of architectural postmodernism, digitality in general pertained and still pertains to postmodernity in the more general sense of postmodern philosophy, thinking, and culture. Postmodern philosophers and POMO architects alike had argued for differentiation, variation, and choice against the dominion of the mechanical age and of modernist standardization. You may recognize the source of this picture, which is taken from your own magazine. And for all I know, the person who made this picture could be in this room. Philosophers spoke of the fragmentation of master narratives. Architects spoke of radical eclecticism or of the plurality of taste. But the spirit was the same. In the 70s, of course, there was no technological alternative to mechanical mass production other than handmaking and pre-industrial craftsmanship which, in fact, many postmodernists then embraced and favored. But in the 90s, digital tools started to offer a viable technological alternative to industrial mass production and standardization. The alternative was no longer this, but this. Digital tools can deliver just what the POMOS had always wanted, but could never get at a reasonable price. Variations. Variability is what digital tools can best make in all fields and er areas, from physical objects to media objects, from text and music to shirts and shoes, to metal panels and parts of buildings. The digital is about mass producing and customizing variations. In this sense, the digital term was and is postmodernism powered and transformed by electricity, or more pertinently, by electronics. A philosopher and a historian would put it a bit differently and argue that postmodernism created the cultural preconditions or the cultural environment where digital technologies were bound to evolve in the way they did. This is a circular argument, of course, but the bottom line is the same. Digitality is a technical answer to some cultural needs and expectations of postmodernity. It was the technological supply that fulfilled the postmodern demand for variations. Within this general framework, however, postmodern culture also bequeathed bequeathed to digital theories a number of less conspicuous, often unsuspected arguments, ideologies and topics that one would not easily associate with a high-tech revolution. 
From the 90s to this day, digital theory in general and digital design theory in particular have been deeply marked by theories and beliefs of postmodern provenance, but tinted by a strong humanist, indeterminist, phenomenological, spiritualistic, or even vitalistic orientation. Computers and animism may seem unlikely partners. And yet it is a fact that from the beginning, I mean from the 90s and to this day, the adoption of digital technologies in design and making has been strongly influenced by a robust and pervasive irrationalist ideology and by a surprisingly strong anti-technological bias. Now, I am here talking in terms of ideas, but this become more evident if instead of thinking in terms of ideas, we think in terms of persons, person we know. And I can think of at least two digital gurus, two persons who were determinant in the creation of digital theory in the 90s. I know them both, so do you, I presume. And I know that one of them, this digital guru, never touched a computer in his life. Not making that up. When he has to touch a computer, he has an assistant. He has to do, do that for me, because he doesn't touch the machine. And I know another one, and you do know that other person as well, who is a good software um, developer, and he is good at scripting, so he uses computer for that, but he does not own a cell phone. I don't think he ever used the internet for anything at all. He does use email, but when he has to buy a plane ticket, he takes the phone, he calls the travel agent, and then he wants the ticket to be faxed by the travel agent to him, which is becoming increasingly different because no one except him is still using a fax machine. <laughs> now, these are not people friendly to technology. This is what I mean. This is what I mean by a robust anti-technological trend. These are people who made the digital revolution in architecture. And you see what they think of technology. Now, there is no time here to review all or even a few of these anti-technological theories, which mostly derive from system theory, complexity theory, and the so-called post-modern sciences of indeterminacy. In the 90s, it was common among designers to refer to this way of thinking as non-linearity. And Charles Jenks and Manuel de Landa must be credited for bringing this term to the attention of the design professions. Let me go back to one example, or one of the examples that were common at the time to illustrate this matter. Ima imagine a, a sand pile or a heap of sand. If we let each grain of sand fall from above in a steady and regular way, and assuming all the grains are the same, the sand pile will acquire the geometrical shape of a cone. The angle at the base of the cone, which engineers call the angle of internal friction, depends on the diameter of the grains or granulometry, the material of which they are made, humidity and perhaps something else, which can be calculated using a fairly simple formula, which I remember I studied at school and I immediately forgot, but the formula is it, it, it's still in the books. As the grains keep falling and the pile grows, this angle remains the same until, at some point, one grain will provoke a catastrophe. The pile will collapse, and after some turmoil and plastic reorganization of the sand pile, a new shape will emerge and stabilize. As it seems, the point in time when the catastrophe occurs cannot be calculated and cannot be predicted, meaning Identical experiments repeated ad libitum will always give different results. Likewise, each new configuration of the pile after the collapse will be different from all others, and none can be predicted. In short, the sand heap will at some point self-organize and find a new form in an undeterminable, unpredictable way. Indeterminacy, in this instance, 
may mean two different things. First, that the sand pile is undeterminable, the line, the penultimate line, meaning we do not have the tools or skill to describe it properly, to model it fully, and to do all the calculation we would need to predict the behavior of the sand pile, or that our observation tweak the object and influence its behavior, etc., etc. <coughs> this is a positivistic approach, implying that if we had enough science and computing power, if we could hire a team of you know, rocket scientists and give to them all the computers in the world, perhaps in a few months they could predict the fall of the sand pile as effectively as we can predict the fall of this pen to the ground, which we can do. You cannot predict when I'm going to let it drop, but you can predict when I let it drop, how long it takes to hit the floor. So far, so good. But then there is another approach which posits that the sand pile is inherently indeterminate. That's the last line. Implying that the sand pile is endowed with free will. And it may make decisions as arbitrary as any living, intelligent, and animated being. If this may appear a long shot to many of us, this way of thinking, called vitalism, is deeply embedded in some religions and in most pre-modern Western science. And many in the past, and some to this day, including people I know, and people probably you know as well, do in fact believe in the animation of the inorganic, as well as in magic and in many other supernatural things that cannot be easily proven with facts and figures, but there are other ways to do it. If you are a druid, for example. Of course, the notion that computers at some point may acquire a faculty of will and become capable of choice is long established in the history of science fiction. And you all know what happens if you build a space ship you entrust it to a computer called HAL 9000. Then you take a walk in space and you come back and you ask HAL 9000 to open that door. Which, of course, as you know the story, HAL 9000 will not do. This was Stanley Kubrick in 1968. But in the 90s, <coughs> The growing complexity of digital networks increasingly suggested and encouraged the notion that computers and the internet are indeed self-organizing systems, and that they may behave in apparently non-linear, indeterminable ways. This stands to reason, because the internet, for example, evolved from a military technology which was meant to do just that meaning to self-organize and reorganize randomly after some catastrophic destruction. Again, for most people, the indeterminacy of the internet was and is just a metaphor, a strategy for the management of technological complexity. However, traces of a similar vitalistic belief in the animation of the inorganic, and particularly in the animation of networked technical systems. Some of these ideas are ubiquitous in the digital culture of the 90s, sometimes taken metaphorically, but sometimes taken literally. Some of this thinking is also reflected in the discourse and in the experiments of the 90s on what was then called cyberspace, hypersurfaces, virtual reality, and what Brian Masumi then called digital phenomenology, meaning a digitally mediated, hallucinatory, and multisensorial alternative to physical space, as found, for example, in some coeval work by Lars Spuibroek, with whom, or to whom, um, Brian Masumi was referring at the time. This is... Uh, Lars' famous 
water pavilion, which still exists somewhere um, in Holland. Now, all of this remained in the 90s. And by the way, these pictures are not Photoshop, photo montage. This is what you see if you go inside Lars' water pavilion. I don't know, I was never inside, but Lars told me that it is a realistic image of the experience you have if you navigate inside the pavilion. <clears throat> now, all this remained in the 90s, a relatively marginal intellectual and cultural phenomenon. These were, after all, the extreme views of a group of radical thinkers and ideologues, trendy at times, yes, but limited to some circles. But today, today, much more of that, in my opinion, is happening. Today, many of these arcane theories have been largely vindicated by techno-social change, probably beyond the wildest expectations of their postmodern prophets. Postmodern philosophers tended to be vaticinatories, obscure, disgruntled, and often apocalyptic. But today, their visions have been turned into reality by a bunch of high-tech startups and by a new generation of adolescent entrepreneurs, most of whom may have never heard the names of Gilles Deleuze or Ilya Prigozhin. Technosocial change is as incremental as it is pervasive, so this bizarre development may have gone unnoticed. Yet it is a fact that indeterminacy is now a staple of our daily digital life, often tacitly accepted and taken for granted. Indeterminacy has already infiltrated many of our new technologically driven social practices, our economic behavior, even science. Whether we like it or not, we are all non-linear now, which is a title we should suggest to Bruno Latour for his next book. Again, there is no time here to discuss to what extent big data, for example, has brought non-linearity into our daily lives. But for example, we all know full well that most media objects today live in a permanent state of random drift, and that it is increasingly difficult, as well as pointless, to try and freeze them in one single, authorial, authorized, stable, and reliable shape or form. Who could have anticipated, only a few years ago, the rise of a new encyclopedia, entirely written by its readers, where entries are offered by many, but by no one in particular, where all pages, or in fact most pages, may be edited by anyone at will, without any control other than communal feedback, which is normally called the wisdom of crowds. Yet Wikipedia works, often surprisingly well, while the good old authorial encyclopedia, encyclopedia Britannica in print has gone out of business. Gmail original motto, search, don't sort, phased out a notion of classification and taxonomies which was so ingrained in our minds that we would have thought it timeless and universal. The idea is that we must, the idea that we must sort and classify events in order to make sense of the world goes back in its present form to Aristotle. And the historian of philosophy could <coughs> argue that without Aristotle's predicaments, or genus, species, arborescent categories, there is no Western philosophy. If that is so, then Google is not Western, nor are its users, which, of course, is true, because most of Google's users are non-Western today. From the beginning of time, classification or sorting has been our tool of choice for information retrieval. We put things in spaces, in places, following some order, so we know where to look for them when we need them. But Google is training us to leave documents unsorted, because digital search, which looks for a string of characters anywhere, across a corpus of any size, <coughs> is so fast that there is no need to pre-sort documents and put them in folders. Putting document documents in smaller folders with a title or label was necessary for manual searching, but it is useless for computer searching. 
this principle needs not be limited to media objects. It may extend to physical objects of all kinds, which can be tag tagged and tracked using radio frequency identification. This may apply to random junk in a garage, to books in a library, or to the full inventory of Amazon.com. Indeed, items of all sorts in Amazon warehouses, including books, are not sorted based on subject or category, but only based on the frequency of sale, <coughs> following an order which is perfectly meaningless to a human mind. Using the same technical logic, in our houses we could keep potatoes, socks, books, and fish in the same drawers. Or indeed, anywhere. We would not need to remember where we put things or where things are because a Google search would find them anywhere and at all times. The same Google logic needs not be limited to space. It may apply to time as well. If every event that ever happened can be recorded, searched, and retrieved, in many cases, the search for an exact precedent may replace many other technologies of prediction, including modern science as we know it. Indeed, in many fields of predictive science, from weather forecasting to material sciences, information retrieval and digital simulation have already replaced the traditional, analytic, cause-to-effect approach of modern science. Many scientists have already come to the conclusion that sometimes, instead of calculating results based on functions and parameters, it is easier to assume that whatever happened before, if it has been recorded and if it can be retrieved, will simply happen again. This is famously what meteorologists are doing. Ten years ago, they would have studied the weather and weather patterns based on physical laws. So they would have studied pressure, temperature, relative humidity, um, something else, winds probably, and with formulas which derive from thermodynamic, they would have calculated when and where condensation, meaning rain, would occur in this fluid, which is the atmosphere. Today, as far as I understand, they are not doing that anymore. Weather is recorded, it is archived, and they search for precedent, and when they find a weather pattern which is repeating itself again, they find the statistical percents whereby it may evolve in a certain way, and this is the weather forecasting which they publish. Mathematicians say that they do not know why this way works better, but it does work better, so they are using it. This is not unlike what Galileo and Newton would have thought, but Galileo and Newton did not have big data. In fact, often they had very few data indeed. In a sense, Western science as a whole was a cultural technology developed to cope with a chronic shortage of data. As the data they could keep and process at the time were not many, they learned to use abstract formulas to extrapolate and generalize patterns from the few data they had. But as we now have access to more and more data, paradoxically, we need fewer and fewer calculations. If we can find the exact precedent to the event we are studying, we do not need to compare, generalize, and extrapolate from a limited record of a few similar ones. In short, it seems safe to conclude that in many walks of life and of science, too, the old cause to effect deterministic causalistic approach, approach which we used to take for granted, at least to predict the behavior of the inorganic world, has already been replaced by a new post-modern and post-scientific method, which is not based on cause to effect determination or determinism, but quite the opposite, on probabilism, statistics, and increasingly heuristics and holistic processes. More and more often we do not calculate, we search and retrieve. 
and more and more often we can better deal with a complex system as a whole than with the simpler logic of its predictable parts. Regardless of any ideological or cultural stance, some of these developments are already reshaping our approach to design. We may or may not be aware of the cultural provenance of these ideas and beliefs or of their vast philosophical implications, but that is irrelevant. This seems to be simply the way many of today's digital tools work best, at least in our present cultural and technological environment. And if we use these tools as we do, we cannot avoid some of this technical logic. In many ways, sometimes openly, sometimes tacitly, indeterminism is becoming one of the main ingredients of today's digital intelligent design. Let me review briefly a number of scenarios and design strategies that share, I think, a similar indeterministic inclination, and which are becoming increasingly frequent among today's intelligent designers. Case number one, and this was the topic of my talk last year, the Wikipedic style of many hands. In a Wikipedia-like design environment, objects are made by many, but by no one in particular. The object of design is forever drifting, permanently open to interactive editing and participatory versioning. Hence, objects are never finished and can never be entirely reliable or fully functioning. This mode of making is fast becoming a dominant technical paradigm of our time, but it is unsuited to building, as buildings must be built at some point and they cannot keep changing much <laughs> after that. Yet the logic of building information modeling and of integrated project delivery, or IPD, is very close to the collaborative spirit of this game. Indeterminacy and open-endedness in the case of BIM, are mostly limited to design notations prior to building, meaning to pure information. But they could, in theory, extend to the functioning life of the building, which must be maintained and taken care of after it has been delivered. This was case one, made very short because I gave a full lecture um, here last fall on this very point. So let's move to point two. The picture bottom left was taken in 2004, but you may still recognize some of these people. These experiments were made in this building um, almost 10 years ago. Generative evolutionary scripts. Parametric scripts can be instructed to generate random variations, which are then automatically selected based on the feedback deriving from a chosen set of data, from patterns of use, for example, or from some material conditions, or whatever. The whole process emulates and almost reenacts Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection in two stages. First, random variations. Second, elimination of the losers and survival of the fittest for each given environment. In the 90s, designers often referred to the morphogenetic theories of Darcy Thompson in a similar context. More recently, digital design theory has largely adopted the terms of emergence and self-organizing systems, in turn borrowed from postmodern system theory. This mode of product evolution by automatic selection is current in the design of many media objects, and famously in the case of web design, where it is practiced under the understated and misleading name of A-B testing. In A-B testing, design choices are made by trying out two versions of the same interface and comparing user data. When a new version, the B version, of a website works better than the old one, the A version, for example, because users stay longer on the page or click on a link more often, then the change is automatically adopted. So one 
version is phased out, killed, and the other version is blocked in because it is fittest. Variations used to be introduced by hand by actual designers, but in most cases today they are randomly generated. In this case, we can argue that the system self-organizes by accidental mutations and environmental feedback or natural selection, just as in Darwin's model of biological evolution. The same form generates many random variations, and the one that happens to best fit a given environment, the strongest form survives to the detriment of all others that are killed. A variation of that is, and this picture was also made here 10 years ago, a variation of the above is often practiced by designers testing the material performance of some particularly unwieldy structural system. Typically, the anelastic or anisotropic deformations of some non-standard materials may be too difficult to calculate analytically. And instead of mathematical calculations, designers must resort to tests with physical models, often with mock-ups in full size. In other terms, the only way to see how these systems will perform under stress or load is to build them and watch. This empiric approach to structural design is often called structural form finding, implying that this system will deform under stress to reorganize in macroscopic but unpredictable ways. And the system will in the end stabilize by choosing a new form or shape, which some claim at that point is chosen by the object itself, meaning by nature. Think of the example of a sand pile. It works more or less in the same way. Fry Otto and Anthony Gaudi are frequently cited as pioneers of this method. The shape of a soap bubble, the deformation of a catenary rope, or a batch of knotted linen hanging from a ceiling are said to be cases in point. For some, this mode of design is simply an opportunistic shortcut we choose when we prefer not to call in the engineers or we do not want to pay for the work that the engineers would need to do. For others, it's a quite different story. Some think that there are things in nature that even the best science cannot and will never predict. So make and watch is the only way to know. Time will tell. In cases less complicated than those just mentioned, however, digital simulations increasingly offer the possibility to test the performance of a given system on the screen rather than in reality. Think of the easiest case of material resistance, elastic deformation or thermal behavior. The visual feedback on the screen is now so fast that the designer can keep tweaking the design and test it in simulation for as many times as necessary, meaning until the desired performance is obtained. The designer can thus optimize a structural solution by the simulation of repeated trials and errors rather than by predictive analytic calculation. So once again, we do not be, need the engineers here. We just make and break, and at some point it will stand up. That's fine, that's what we need. And we avoid the engineer's bill. This is, by the way, a process which is similar to what traditional craftsmen once did. The ideal archetypal craftsman is not an engineer nor an architect. Craftsmen neither design nor calculate. They just keep making and remaking an object until it doesn't break. And they learn often tacitly from this experience. Today, using digital simulation, designers can make and break on the screen in a minute more objects than a traditional craftsman would have made and broken in a lifetime. Designed by feeling and by intuition, designed by the gesture of the hand, which some call designed by making, has become a viable alternative to the analytic, predictive approach of modern science and of modern design. 
So once again, engineers are out of job. Examples could continue, but let me jump to a conclusion. Evidently, this is not design as we knew it. The pattern common to these disparate trends seems to be that increasingly we are redefining and limiting the ambit of design because we assume that digitally empowered systems are capable to self-organize and digitally empowered systems can find the best solution by themselves, either by gleaning and gathering the wisdom of crowds or by letting nature find its way. Both of these solutions can be a bit problematic for many of us. They are problematic for the design professions, of course. They also have vast philosophical, ideological, social, and political implications. If we assume that some digitally empowered objects can and should self-organize, then we need fewer design decisions, less design, and fewer designers. The first to be phased out are the engineers, but then we are next in line. Likewise, if we assume, by analogy, that some digitally empowered social systems can and should self-organize, then we could need less social regulation, hence less government, or as some say, smaller government. Now, the jungle is a self-organizing system. You see, there is a lion eating an antelope. An antelope? But there is a big cat lurking in the background. You see it behind, and so it's waiting, and the winner will still have a fight. Which is one reason why humans often do not like to live in the jungle, or even simply in the wilderness. Now, of course, here in England, you have it easy. You go out in the countryside, and all that you find are squirrels and strawberry fields, I presume. But in Connecticut, where I have been spending some time of recent, if you live just a few miles from the genteel, I've covered halls of Yale University, the countryside there hides a thriving population of raccoons, possums, skunks, and coyotes. Now, coyotes are not nice guys. They come in at night and they tend to eat your cats. Not my cat, I don't have one, but it appears that they recently tried to eat some of Peter Eisenman's cats. So, which is one reason why we build cities, and we often like to live in them, to protect our cats from the coyotes. Now, unlike the jungle, and in spite of a pervasive ideological commonplace, cities are not self-organizing systems. They are not self-organizing systems because nature does not build cities. Cities are not mushrooms. Cities are not built by nature, they are built by us. We build cities and we try to organize them as designers as well as citizens. Thank you. But <laughs> um, a real coyote, not a metaphorical one, just no, like a dog. Um, I would like to um, ask you to um, discuss, if you wish, things with Mario. To whom? I, <laughs> I guess my question um, in terms of digital design off of an architectural history precedent, would you think the closest comparison, because in the way you describe it, it sounds almost like the digital designer is a brick allure, you know, as a trial and error, and then you sort of pick things up and then use them as needed. And I guess that's kind of interesting if that's really coming from a phenomenological so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. 
I wouldn't use the term bricoleur, but you know, we talked about digital craftsmanship or digital artisanship. You are in my class yeah. in, in the morning. So yeah. what we are discussing is how in the Renaissance this idea came to life that architecture cannot be made as a craftsman makes a pair of shoes. Um, it's not a matter of craftsmanship. And in the Renaissance, this idea was created that designers should make drawings. Drawings should be given to the builders and the builder, and the building should be made. And that there is a separation between the thinker and the maker. The thinker thinks, doesn't make. The maker makes, is not allowed to think. This was a way to create the modern architect as an intellectual, a scientist, etc., etc., not a craftsman. And this paradigm, this cultural, technical, ideological paradigm has been driving architecture, with a few exceptions, of course, in the West until 15 or 20 years ago. Because, as we know, the digital does not work that way. You can make it work that way, and it is possible if you make a particular effort, but if you use the digital in the way which is inherent in its technical logic, you think and make at the same time. And the forthcoming revolution of 3D printing will prove it uh, in every house. Now, I'm not particularly enthusiastic. I mean, I do not think that every house needs to have a 3D printer on, on the desk to do what, but which is what you know the gurus are saying. But this is what we in architecture have been claiming since the early 90s, file to factory. You conceive, you make it on the screen, you print it, you take the object, you can tweak it, you scan it, you have it on the screen, so there is a seamless continuity between the representation, the notation, the object and its fabrication, which brings us back to the ideal state of designing and making, not necessarily at the same time, but it is certainly made and conceived by the same person. So the separation, which was the paradigm of modernity, thinkers don't make, makers don't think, is falling apart for better, for worse. Some people may not like it, but if, you know, it is not the end of the world. I mean, architecture existed before Alberti invented the modern way of designing. In the Albertian way, each building was made, was invented by one person. So if you see a building, you ask, who made it? You do not mean who put one brick on another brick. You mean who invented the idea of that building. But go and look at any Gothic cathedral, they are there, there are plenty of them, they are standing up, they con we consider them architectural masterpieces. Who made the Cathedral of Chartres? We don't know who designed it, no one designed it, and yet there was a way of building, but in a collective um, communal way. Evidently they could do it, it is possible. If it is possible then in the dark ages when they could not even drink coffee in the morning, we could be able to do, you know, much better. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for showing that image from Fulcrum. I'm very proud of it, and it's very are kind you, of you. Are you the inventor? I am Jack, yes. <laughs> I invented <laughs> nice that <thing>. image. Um, <laughs> my question was about, uh, I think, uh, what I wanted to ask you about was really the, the morality of this kind of uh, digital design, and your own opinion about not just uh, the direction that it's moving in, but in a, a positivist, uh, in a a uh, positive way, whether you think this should be the way that design should move? If I could predict the future, I would be making a more profitable profession than the one <laughs> <coughs> I am doing. Um, I wish I could tell you where this is going. I can see that it can be going in a few different directions. There are some I like, there are some I fear. You may understand from the story I've been telling, but in my opinion, indeterminacy as a tool of design, not only of digital design, but as a tool of all, uh, as, an as an inevitable ingredient of a digitally determined environment has, in my opinion, a lot of risks in it. 
This may simply mean that we are not used to it. This may simply mean that we are retrograde and that we are retarded there. It is also a matter of ideology. I still think, as far as I am concerned, that designers should design and governments should govern. I do not think that objects are capable of self-organizing and I do not think that society should be allowed to you know, self-organize because societies are not the jungle. Societies are an alternative to the jungle. And the city where we like to live is an alternative to the jungle because we prefer to live in a system which is not self-organized, but it is designed and organized by us. Now, it is true that there is something inherent and embedded in the technical logic of digitality which is going in that direction. Um, it is, as always, a risk and an opportunity. So it may be exploited, and it is possible, by the most reactionary political agendas of our time. But this is not inevitable. I mean, we must be aware of what is at stake so that we can, you know, act as responsible citizens. I would not use the digital in that way. But it is possible to use the technology in that sense. And when these people find out, uh, well, probably they will never find out. So let's not worry. Let's hope not. They don't, you know, they don't study media theories. So. <clears throat> Hello. So you are advocating for in their in that term as a way of designing, right? Sorry, I do not, I do not hear you. Okay, so you're arguing for inter being a way of designing, right? But is the architect still responsible for what he's producing? Well, again, big question. The long and short of it is that using digital tool authorship is no longer what it used to be using digital tools, there is an indeterminacy in the process of making decision, which is inevitable. We must be aware that it is there because we may choose to fight against it. This is, my, in my opinion, a losing battle because if you try to fight a battle against the direction that the combined forces of economy and technology are going, you're going to lose. Look at the music industry. They tried to fight, you know, downloads of music and you see they lost. So, Using digital tools, and we must be aware that there is a parametricism which is embedded in every digital tool, and parametricism inevitably implies the possibility of an, in, of an open form of authorship, meaning that more people may interact with the same notation. We must be aware of that, because even if we do not like it, at some point, the tools will be used that way. And so we must know what is at stake. And I'm not going to give you, I don't have a recipe. Um, but each one, as designers, must find one. Otherwise, you end up like the music industry. Hello. Um, is there not a, uh, um, uh, is there not uh, the a possibility of the problem that um, indeterminacy becomes an aesthetic, that um, if you look to, I don't know how familiar you are with um, glitch art, but uh, in the field of art, particularly in uh, contemporary music videos, um, the uh, idea of inter indeterminacy in terms of glitch has become an aesthetic which can be applied. Um, so you get the uh, appearance of indeterminacy, but without any of the um, you know, difficulty of actually having to be indeterminate. Um, that's, a, that's a very good point. There is an aesthetic of indeterminacy, which has been around for 30 years, meaning the idea of you know, the open work of art and indeterminacy it has been, it's, it's an emanation of late modernity, even before uh, postmodernity. But, and we do see many digitally created objects by trendy people, some are my friends, I will not mention them, and they give an idea of indeterminacy, but oftentimes some of these works, and I, no names, no, sh no images, think you will all find your own example, 
some of his work, which give the perfect idea of the gorgeous indeterminacy of nature. They are, in fact, excruciatingly designed in the most precise, meticulous way. So there is a style, there is an image of indeterminacy. We think that indeterminacy must have a certain look. And this is a sign of the times. People understand somehow that we are dealing with indeterminacy. But they do not like to be indeterminate in design because they want to design things so that things designed by them give an idea, a stylistic idea, of what we think the superior indeterminacy of nature should look like. This is exactly what is happening. Some people are cheating, but many people are actually a victim of their own persuasion. They do not understand. They think that they are being celebrated, that they are celebrating indeterminacy because they make these fantastic clouds made of you know, stuff which moves in the wind, etc., etc. But then, to have this image of indeterminacy in a built object, they spend six months in, you know, in, at, at, at the screen. And it is not an indeterminate notation. Even the most, you know, apparently random movement of the object is excruciatingly calculated by them in advance. Some may cheat, some do not rush. Well, it's a sign of the time. We are dealing with indeterminacy. So sometimes we want to work in an indeterminate way, but as designer, more, most often not. And yet, we understand that we live in times where indeterminacy is, you know, it has good reputation. After all, indeterminacy means that you celebrate the power of nature, and nature is, you know, something good. It's strawberry fields and um, squirrels and, uh, you know, ivy leaves, and um, that, that's one way to look at it. If you think of the coyotes, you will come to another conclusion. But Yes, it is true. There is a, a visual style which celebrates indeterminacy, which means that we are all aware, or the digitally intelligent avant-garde, we are aware, they are aware, we are all aware that indeterminacy is the crucial, is one of the argument of today's digital intelligent design. So in some way, stylistic or process-based, we have to deal with it. Ideally, we should use both, process and style, but, you know, takes time. But isn't it that this uh, moment of indeterminacy becomes frozen? And it becomes frozen and in fact becomes uh, extremely determinable. And the space that we no longer talk about is totally a frozen, determined, specific space. Well. There is another possible misunderstanding here. Buildings, once built, are unlikely to be indeterminate or indeterminable. What is open, indetermined, or indeterminable is the design process, which is pure information. So this is where this game may happen. And then the building may celebrate this process in a metaphorical or stylistical way. Exactly. But it is difficult. So it's mm. not reflected in architecture in the end. Well, in <laughs> some architecture it is. Some of our friends are creating objects which visualize a certain idea of indeterminacy. Even though the building, when it is built in reinforced concrete, it is hyper-determined, the maximum of interactivity that, you know, we have been dealing with it for a long time. You can open windows, you can move uh, partitions, and some technical system inside the building can, you know, windows can open automatically. But these are gadgets. This is not what is at stake. Indeterminacy as an ingredient, as a component of a digital process, is, is an epistemological, an ontological problem. It affects the nature of the offer. Who makes what? What are the limits of your making? And when the building is built, it may or it may not represent the conundrums and the problematics embedded in the process, purely notational, through which the building was eventually built. Reinforced concrete is not very indeterminate. Now, a sponge could be, but sponges are not used for building, or not really, not much. Just to, probably on, uh, just to, uh, a, a small question uh, on, on the idea of uh, the aesthetics of uh, indeterminacy. Yeah. Um, 
what's your which are your thoughts on on on, on the way the, the on the role of the image and the in relation to the internet as a way to uh, spread architecture or misspread or miscommunicate architectural knowledge today huh. uh, i mean uh, is it, uh, i don't know <laughs> <laughs> that's that's another topic which could be for another seminar but you know there was a time when i was a student when i opened an architectural magazine there were photographs in it there were photographs and there were renderings. A photograph was the trace of the document of something which existed in reality. A rendering was an artist's interpretation of something which does not exist in nature. The distinction is crystal clear, or was crystal clear. Today, every image we see has been digitized at some point. And when you go through digitization, the indexical trace, which one linked the photographic image to nature, has been broken. So, Digital images are no longer true to reality. They may be or they may not be. There is no way to tell. In today's architectural publication, I was going through the, um, uh, the website of a colleague recently who is coming up for tenure, and so we have to write reports. And there are pages and pages of digital images on his website. On his website. There is no way, but really no way to tell if any of those objects was ever built. Photographs look like rendering, renderings look like photographs. Sometimes the caption should say if it was built, but in most cases, they do not say. So between the traditional indexical photograph, a document which represents reality, and today digital images, which are indeterminate, because we cannot determine their degree of indexicality or fidelity to nature. So the only way to know if a digital image is true to reality is to have the reality in front of you and compare, which is more or less what a medieval artist should have done. So once again, the digital is bringing us back to the Gothic cathedrals. My I'm waiting for the time when someone will write a review on a printed authoritative magazine on the Monde, for example, or with a beautiful literary critique of a building claiming that he has visited it, but using, you know, only digital renderings, and then someone will say, oh, oh by the way, <laughs> that building was never built. Mm -hmm. it, it may have happened already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, may I just go um, back to something you said, which part of your, of the title of the, of the lecture and something we discussed the form finding. So if we take indeterminacy as component of uh, the process and not as a formal component, so we, in one way what we are talking about is another mode of operation. So it has nothing to do with the process of management, the practice of management or organization, at least as we know this practice within modernity. right? So, and that of course leads to the question of the author. So there is not one person uh, who events, who has the idea, conceives, but also there is not one person who manages or organizes the whole. So that means we move to the scale of the micro-management. So we have the micro-scale within the, um, it, it uh, is the process. Uh, and I, I think that it's there where the, what you're saying about social or political or even ideological implications where they come in when we talk about the form of micromanagement instead of the management because then uh, what, who or what is to regulate all these micromanagements? Form finding is a term which was once again borrowed mathematicians use the term and I do not know what they mean but it is something completely different from what architects and designers mean. But to go back to the, uh, to the, um, to the example of a, of a sand pile, form finding means that you cannot design the shape of a sand pile after the catastrophe and its reorganization. But it means that you repeat the experiment many times. And among these random events, each one a catastrophe, each one indeterminable or indeterminate, you will find the one you need. So you do not make it, nature makes it. You just find it, not made by you, chosen by you. Pardon? 
Well, you make them all, and then you look at them, and you say, this is the one I prefer, which is the typical conundrum of early digital creation in the 90s when animation software using parametric scripting created, you know, endless variation of the same script. And then the typical question was, well, you can see it in a movie, but at some point you cannot build them all. You must build one. How do you choose the one? And then you say, well, I just find it. <laughs> and <laughs> but of course we go back to, you know, you must intuit the one you like. But the, the ideology which is embedded in the use of this term form finding implies that there is now a participation between an event that you do not control, but which you regulate to some extent. After all, you organize the experiment and you profit from it because you let <coughs> indeterminacy produce the events, many of them a random succession, and then you choose the one which will be the best fit. Of course, you can automate the whole process, like in A-B testing, where the system creates endless variations, and the system chooses the one which performs better. In some simple cases, it can already be done. And this is evidently a very different notion of authorship, because you design, your design is like a bottle you throw at sea. You throw a bottle at sea with a message in it, and you do not know who and when will find it. You just ignite the process, and then you let it work its way. This is indeed what A-B testing means. You design the system, then you put it, you start it, and then you don't know what will happen. It will live its own life. Then it's more to initiate. Pardon? To initiate, form initiating. <laughs> well, form <laughs> initiating, yes. <laughs> form making, form finding, form and form initiating. Well, form conception. It's more biologic. So it's not are there any other questions? Have the last one. Yes. yes. Okay. Hi, Mary. Thank you for the talk. That was really wonderful. Um, it's just a quick one, really. I just wondered, um, going back to the start of your talk, you were saying that uh, it's now a period where we can get some sort of distance on the first unfolding of a kind of digital culture. And I just wondered if you had... Um, in the same way Charles Jenks identified pruitt Igo as a certain terminal moment. Yes. But you have particular specific buildings that you feel kind of bookend this period. Oh, yes, yes. Maybe ones that specifically started off and ones that terminated. Yes, yes, yes. I, I have my landmarks, uh, my, 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 my timeline. So this is the dates and the places and the names of people I use when I teach. So I have a cluster of events around 1993, and I have a few more around 2000, 2001, something else around 2004. Yes, this is, you know, what historians do. We need to categorize to make the story so simple that even a teacher can use it. Yeah, I'm looking for specifics, but not... <laughs> not uh, oh, you want to know which ones? Yeah, specifics. Uh, well, <laughs> come to my class. <laughs> <laughs> You're so reluctant to disclose. <laughs> no, the beginning, the beginning is easy. For me, the beginning is 1993, folding in architecture. Peter Eisenman, Greg Lean, Gilles Deleuze, Bernard Cash. This junction was the starting point. And then, for the rest, come to the class. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Yes, thank um, you very much for that but wonderful talk. I have one special thank to the, from myself to the audience. This is, for me, a work in progress. So I have more questions than answers. So I use your questions to revise my paper. And so the next release will be probably, it's yes, a work in progress. So thank you very much for your useful feedback. Thank you. Please do join us tomorrow for more questions. Yeah.